Welcome to episode 30 of the Growing Space podcast. In today's episode, I am going to be sharing with you a conversation that I had with my good friend, Craig LaHoulier. You'll learn all about Craig here in a second when I ask him to introduce himself to you all. But let me just give you a little teaser for how incredible... <laughs> of a food grower, a home food grower this man is. So Craig and I have been friends now for probably like actually as long as I've owned my business, The Patio Farmer. So going on seven years now, and he is an avid home food grower, small space food grower, and he's kind of a big deal, y'all. He goes by the nickname, the NC Tomato Man, on Instagram and on his social, but Craig has a pretty impressive tomato portfolio. For example, he named and popularized the Cherokee Purple Heirloom Tomato, which is by far one of the most popular and most sought out heirloom tomatoes. He is also a tomato breeder. You guys, he like makes different kinds of tomato plants. And he has a special type of tomato that he likes to breed for small spaces. You'll learn all about that little tomato in today's episode. And he's a published author. He's written two books. One is called Epic Tomatoes, and it is just this beautiful volume of information all about celebrating tomatoes. So you guys are in for such a huge treat. Make sure you check today's show notes for more information on how to find Craig, how to keep learning about tomatoes from Craig, and to check out his two books. The other book that Craig has written is called Growing Vegetables in Straw Bales. So that's another one of his specialties is (laughs) turning straw bales into beautiful, lush food growing containers, truly. Uh, zero waste containers as well. So you guys are in for such a treat and I am so excited that I get to share this conversation that I had with you. Craig has also been just like a massive supporter for me and my business. Uh, We have presented at conferences together. He's been guests to Plant Club many, many times over the years. So anyway, I am just so tickled to share with you this interview that I had with my friend, the NC Tomato Man, Welcome to the Growing Space Podcast. I'm your host, Farmer Erin, owner of The Patio Farmer, and I believe that no matter what size space you have, you can grow food at home. Tune in every Tuesday as I share my best tips, tricks, and encouragement for tending to homegrown edible plants. I'm here to support your food growing journey. The Growing Space Podcast is sponsored by Plant Club by The Patio Farmer. Plant Club by The Patio Farmer is a monthly subscription service I started in 2020. It's a membership-based opportunity to take your growing journey to the next level. With four different membership options, you get to decide the amount and kind of support that's right for you. All Plant Club members receive access to my online community through a platform called Circle. Having access to this platform allows members to share pictures, ask questions, celebrate harvest, and get to know each other. All Plant Club members also have access to free seeds each month, along with information on how to plant and tend to their crops, with seeding instructions and downloadable resources from the Patio Farmers Resource Library. Membership starts at just $14 a month. Join Plant Club today by visiting my website, thepatiofarmer.com slash membership. All right, Craig, I am so excited to have you as a guest on my podcast today. Thank you for taking the time to just talk to us all about tomatoes. And I was wondering if you could start off just by introducing yourself to us and all that you do with tomatoes. Sure. And first of all, thank you, Erin. This is a delight to be on your podcast, to realize that you started a podcast. You and I go back five, six, seven years where we actually met at a most unique event, the very first of the Charlotte uh, area 
tomato tastings. I even forgot what they called it, but it, it was a delight meeting you then. And sometimes you meet people and you know there's going to be a friendship that sprouts from that seed. And, and here we are, right? So my name is Craig LaHoulier, living in Hendersonville, North Carolina. Oh, gosh, I think I've been a gardener now for almost for 40 years or more. And I've been a, a seed saver. I used to be a, well, I'm still a chemist, but I, I used to work in big pharma. We'll let that go. Those were 25 years I don't really want to think about. But sometimes you just got to do stuff to support, to support the family. But in parallel to that, I developed this real passion for gardening and developed a keen interest in heirloom tomatoes and through my work in the Seed Savers Exchange, became their tomato advisor, which I still do, even though they rarely ask me to advise anything. It's still something that's kind of cool to say. Started getting to amateur tomato breeding. And so for 18 years, we've been running the Dwarf Tomato Breeding Project and wrote up tomatoes along the way. And then um, Story asked me to write a book on straw bales, meaning I had to learn about it. And I wrote that book. So now I'm kind of the straw bale gardener, container gardening dude, dwarf tomato dude, heirloom guy. But mostly I love to garden and share what I learn because, Erin, as you and I know, our most important thing is to grow gardeners and, and get people to join us in this wonderful pursuit. So thank you again. This is fun. Yeah, well, I'm just so thrilled. You're so generous with your time and sharing information and all of your tomato growing knowledge. I don't think I know anyone else who knows as much about tomatoes as you. <laughs> and I only know a fraction, I'm sure, of what there is to know in total. And, you know, I, I love it when people say I'm an expert gardener. And there are no expert gardeners. There are just gardeners that each year make mistakes, learn new things, make the same mistakes, have to learn it again. And it is a lifelong journey, which is why I've always felt gardening is the best hobby because there's literally no end to it, is there? No. And that's so true. I mean, we're all just, we're all just along for the ride and learning yeah. from our plants every season, every year. Some of us just have more seasons or years under our belts than others. And that's why it's so great to learn from, you know, to learn from each other. Now, I, I have lots of questions that I want to ask you about sure. the various projects and things that you've been involved with, but I wanted to start. So your handle on Instagram is the NC Tomato Man. Yeah. And I'm curious, like, what is the story behind going by the name NC Tomato Man? You know, it's 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 not the easiest question to answer because I probably took that name right around 2010, 2011. So I was leaving my job at GlaxoSmithKline and moving all of my communication to Gmail. And, you know, I was on Tomatoville around the time, and I was giving talks around North Carolina. Even even well before I wrote the book, I had these big gardens. And so I just started thinking, well, you know, I'm in North Carolina. I'm growing a lot of tomatoes. I need a Gmail handle. I'm going to be nctomatoman at gmail.com. That translated to Instagram. When people started introducing me at talks, it's like, here's the NC Tomato Man. And you just... Sometimes things evolve from the ether into reality, and I just decided to own it. And And what's interesting is when you start seeing then, I'm Tennessee tomato man, or I'm the Michigan tomato dude, or, you know, the California tomato lady, it's, it is it is a way, I guess, to put a label on something. And at least in this point, it is somewhat accurate. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. We're, we're both tomato obsessed, I will say, <laughs> because who doesn't love growing homegrown tomatoes and eating them? Oh my gosh, homegrown tomatoes. It's almost like a whole different plant from what you would buy in the store. It is. So, and true tr so true confession, the last tomato I ate was August 15th of last year, which is what was at a tomato tasting. The next tomato, and we're talking fresh tomato, we're eating lots of canned tomatoes because we canned a lot. The next tomato I eat will be the first one I pick from this year's garden. So I am so disciplined and so spoiled and so snobby about great tomatoes that I actually take about six months out of my year and decide I'm not going to eat them. So how's that? <laughs> I love that. 
<laughs> I love that. This might be a hard question, but what is your favorite thing about tomatoes? Oh, it's actually not that hard because my favorite thing about tomatoes is the incredible diversity of options for you to grow, coupled with the fact that unlike many crops of what we've lost quite a few through the years through just not good seed saving or letting things go extinct, the race to the latest cover variety on any particular seed catalog. So it, it's the fact that we can grow a lot of history in our garden. The fact that those tomatoes can represent stories and the best way to capture people's interest in garden and gardening, or many pursuits perhaps, is to tell them stories about what you're growing. Oh, here's Cherokee Purple. Oh, let me tell you the story about that. Let me tell you the story about Mortgage Lifter. That helps people garden. And I love to eat. I'm a big dude. And thankfully, tomatoes have very few calories. But I am a... I'm not a super taster. I've kind of done that little test, but I am pretty good at picking out nuances. So dark chocolates, coffee, wine, beer, tomatoes, the same thing. Is it tart? Is it acidic? Is it sweet? Is it fruity? Is it bland? Is it something you want to spit out under the table when people aren't looking? You can take 100 tomato varieties, and if you pay attention, you'll find that each of those 100 varieties tastes slightly different. And those who love to cook can take advantage of that by maximizing their use. These are best raw. These are best cooked. These are best sliced. So you can see the beauty of them. So see, it's not so hard a question to ask because the diversity of the varieties, only apples of things we can grow match tomatoes in the variations of flavor and the historical diversity and richness and all the different colors and shapes and sizes. So I... I I kind of made it easy by choosing something that, and, and they're in about 98% of people's gardens. So how can you go wrong with that? Yeah. I mean, those are all fantastic things about tomatoes. And I love that about how they tell a story and, you know, just goes further into learning from our plants that we're growing at home in our growing spaces. As you know, a lot of my clients and customers and a lot of my podcast listeners grow in small spaces at home. Mm. So there's, you know, a lot of people who are growing in containers or they might have a couple of raised beds. Mm. Some might be growing in the ground, but predominantly we're small space food growers. And you also have experience with growing mm. in small spaces. Mm. Tell us about your growing space that you have at home? Yeah. What does it look like? Yeah, and sure. how do you grow food at home? So I grow in my backyard, which is a really nice sunny spot. We have about a quarter acre fence backyard. And because our septic field is back there, we use straw bales and containers sitting on the lawn back there. And this is just a carryover from when we gardened in Raleigh, where that perfect garden spot that I dug in the ground became imperfect when disease was built up in the soil and the trees grew to reduce the sunlight to where it it wasn't maximized. So you'd end up with 20 foot tall tomato plants with three tomatoes on it. So I moved it all into my driveway. This coupled with the fact that when we were selling tomato seedlings for all those years of the Raleigh Farmer's Market, the most frequently asked question is, you know, I love tomatoes, but I don't want to climb a ladder to pick them. Or I have to grow them in a raised bed or a small container or on my deck or on my driveway. What have you got? So that influenced my desire to start the Dwarf Tomato Breeding Project because up until that, the flavors of the shorter growing tomatoes just didn't match the sun golds and the Cherokee purples and the Jack and the Beanstalk types that everybody loves. And so, so my growing space is roughly on any given year, 20 strawberries sitting nicely spaced with five gallon grow bags in front and i'll have the tall tomatoes two to a straw bale and because i can bang stakes into my lawn i can put eight foot cages or stakes and then we have uh, green beans and straw bales and cucumbers and straw bales and summer squash way too many summer squash we won't even talk about the number of summer squash i stupidly grew last year but when we were in our driveway in raleigh I really needed those shorter plants. Indeterminate tomatoes 
are a challenge to deal with because they sucker at every joint between the leaf and the stem. And you have to decide, what's my strategy? How am I going to keep these vertical? How am I going to keep these off everything else? So I think things like determinate tomatoes like Roma, Taxi, Sophie's Choice, dwarf tomatoes like those that came out of our project. And even these days, people who watched our dwarf project have been doing development on a category called the micro dwarf tomato, which only grow 12 to 18 inches tall. They're primarily cherry tomatoes, but they they allow you to grow good tasting tomatoes in a one gallon container that get no taller than a foot. They're a lot of fun. And there's a company called Bunny Hop Seeds that, that's made the micro dwarfs their specialty and they're selling 40, 50, 60 different types. So I always strive for flavor. This year, my garden is going to be unique. Last year, I had 70 tomatoes in my yard and 115 tomatoes at a nearby farm in a greenhouse the veterans healing farm that I oversaw with a staff of people there. That almost did me in. You know, 67-year-old dude on bad knees on a hot summer day, 180 tomato plants is a lot to take care of. So I've got this bet going with a lot of my friends. I've told them I'm only going to grow 12 tomatoes this year, and nobody believes it. So the gauntlet has been thrown down. I'm determined to stick to that. And they will be my absolute favorites for eating. Cherokee purple, Cherokee chocolate, Cherokee green, Lucky Cross, Polish, things like that. And I'm going to, instead of growing lots of plants and being able to tend them not as well as I might, I'm going to try to really care for these dozen plants well and prune them well and look for the diseases and stake them beautifully and try to maximize the yield off of those 12 plants. So that's kind of what I'm going to do this year. Uh, And I am still going to work at the farm. And But my crew is going to have to take on more of the work. I'm going to be a good delegator. And we'll see how many tomatoes I can squeeze into that space. But just the favorites in the backyard for me this year. Wow, 12 tomato plants. Well, I will certainly be following for updates on how all of those go. (laughs) And I admire your, I admire your restraint because it is so hard choosing which varieties and, but, you know, going with the, with your favorites, I mean, you can't really go wrong there. No. Um, And and the dwarfs, uh, you know, you, I want to get back just a little bit to what you said about people with restrained space, the ability to grow a full-size delicious tomato in containers as small as five gallon and get really good results. Yes, you're going to be watering more often. Um, Yes, you're going to be feeding them more often. But the payoff is not having to climb a ladder to deal with the plants and not having them crawl all over your yard and to keep them, you know, I'm not the neatest person in the world, but there is something about looking at a garden that seems a bit orderly. It creates a little less stress in your life. And you can really have kind of a nice looking garden with the dwarfs, because as you know, you've grown some of them. They're gorgeous plants with that dark bluish green foliage and they're nice crinkly compact form. So yeah, I'm pretty excited about the dwarfs. I don't know if I'm going to grow any of my backyard. I may grow them at the farm. So you can tell I'm still in a big conundrum here on exactly what's going to go into my yard this year. We're recording this. In yeah. January, <laughs> even yeah. though it's gonna go, it's gonna go out in mid-April this time of year before the spring season. It's all about planning and preparing so that when it is April and and May, we're able to just like run with all of our greatest intentions and ambitions. <laughs> what What's really important about what you just said is the importance of planning, which is a, a step that many gardeners skip. Two common mistakes of gardeners is they don't even really plan until it's time to plant. They don't have the plants they need. They haven't really figured out what's going to go where. And so that planning step is very important. The other is the reflection time. Have a pad handy. Have a pen handy. What happened last year? What did I expect? What didn't meet those expectations? And if I don't want to do the definition of insanity thing, I'm going to do the exact same thing this year. Oh my God, I have the same problems. Well, of course you did. So it's the, so gardening is a bit like solving a Rubik's cube where issues will invariably happen. You grow as a gardener by figuring out what some of the possibilities of those, those issues are and making some changes to, to see if you can avoid them. That's what makes it absolutely fascinating, fascinating on a daily basis. I'm sure you make lists. I make lists. I have lists everywhere. 
Yeah, I am a huge list maker. I <laughs> I, I make them in my head pretty much all yes. day. I write them down and there's great satisfaction in crossing something off the list oh, yeah. when it's done. You know, my daughter who's into project management, she gave me this little tip one. She's a list maker. She says, every day have three buckets, one that's easy to do, one that's moderately challenged to do, and one that's maybe been on your list for a while. And your list is going to have many things in each of those three buckets. But if each day you can knock something off each one of those buckets, it gives you a true feeling of progress. So you have written a book all about growing in straw bales, which I will put a link to in the show notes for today's episode. Can you just give us like a high Mm. view snapshot of what is involved or like some nuances to growing in straw bales? Straw bale gardening should be thought of gardening in two 20 gallon container capacity in one cube. That is an enormous amount of root space. It also can be thought of as future perfect loam for the roots of your plants that starts off disease free. So I actually view of straw bale gardening and container gardening in the same ilk, both being quite separate from in-ground gardening because a straw bale garden is gonna need more water. You're, You're exposing the sides of that straw bale to the sun, so you're gonna have a little more evaporation. Um, At the very outset, some of the keys are finding a good source for your straw bales because sadly, in the last three or four years, some people are are having experiences with straw bales where it's clear something has been sprayed on those fields of wheat and that herbicide is getting embedded in the straw that then dries. And when you plant your plants in it, it kills your plants. Now, the good news is I've used about 300 bales in my 10 years of straw bale gardening, and I've had exactly two that have killed my plants, and they came from a big box store. So it's probably good to look at a smaller gardening store, ask if they're certified organic. That's how to get the bale. And wheat is the predominant material. Really, all it takes is a two-week process to charge it up, which is alternating days of applications of a high nitrogen food of some sort. I'm not strictly organic, so I will use a 2805 granular lawn food. If you're strictly organic, you can go with a fish emulsion or blood meal. You do that for about a week alternating days with heavy watering every day. You then need to charge it up with a balanced food. And so you use a 10-10-10 or if you're organic and a spoma, 565 plant tone. You let that work in water, water, water. Two weeks from the day you start this process, you can plant your plants in it. And that internal of the bale is going to start chewing and composting and creating loam. And what I've found is a fringe benefit is your plant maturity dates are reduced because of all that heat cooking in the center of the bale. I, and you can direct seed into them. So I, I harvest summer squash about 37 to 40 days from putting the seed into the potting mix on top of the bale, which is insanely quick. Tomatoes will gain five or 10 days in maturity dates because those roots are hitting that composting creation of loam zone. Because you're going to be watering to keep the plants happy, you're also going to be feeding to keep the plants happy. So once the plants really mature, I'm doing pretty much a daily water and a weekly feed, but I'm just using an all-purpose water-soluble one and a half cups per plant. So once you get into the rhythm of this, you're not weeding. Um, You don't have any disease in those bales. And I tend to pick about 30, 35 pounds of tomatoes per plant in a straw bale. So if I have two tomato plants in a straw bale, I'm picking about 70 pounds of tomatoes from the plants in that bale. Peppers, love it. Eggplant, love it. Um, Green beans. So really, the determining factor is do you have a good source for bales that isn't going to break the bank? Um, We started off here paying about five or six straw bale. Through COVID, the price raised to about seven or eight per straw bale. But that's two 20-gallon equivalents of capacity. And if you think of what it would cost to fill that with high-quality potting mix, you're kind of at a wash. And at the end of the year, 
your two foot bale is now scrunched down to about a 12 inch pile of perfect mulch you can then use in the following year to put into your containers or work into your raised beds. So it's an absolute no waste methodology that gives you two to three years plus of benefit just for that single bale purpose. Have I sold you yet? <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well, I mean, yeah, just, <laughs> I mean, I've heard you talk about straw bales several mm -hmm. times in the past and, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think I might have to do it this year. I will admit I have, I haven't sure. tried it yet, yep. but the fact that you get harvest from direct seeded summer squash yes. in less yes. than 40 days yes. is like, mind-blowing because yeah. you know for those of you listening who haven't grown summer squash from seed before usually it's about a 55 to 60 day yes maturity yeah. so and that's, the other thing is I have, and i have never wa lost a summer squash to the squash vine borer growing them in straw bales oh well there, <laughs> there you, you go. go there you go i mean <laughs> that that is just you know yeah. the cherry on top <laughs> for, for anybody listening to this podcast that, that is interested in this, and this goes for any gardening technique, whether you want to go from in-ground to containers or in-ground to straw bales, dabble lightly in it first. Gardeners tend to be super enthusiastic about something, and they'll say, oh, this sounds great. I'm going to grow 100 straw bales next year. And then you, you realize it's not for you. We garden every year. Wade, think of it as the ocean. Wade in slowly, put your toes in the water, see if you like it first. And then if it is for you, you can continue to transition. So through the years, I've gone from in-ground gardening to full-blown container gardening. And now I'm transitioning to a real mix of containers and straw bales lean towards, leaning towards straw bales. Because of buy, having to buy that mix to put in your containers every year, straw bales have eliminated the need to do that. So, you know, it's been a little bit more cost effective for me, though I do love container gardening as well. It's in-ground gardening that I've kind of turned away from because you don't have to weed and all of the things that you don't have to do anymore. I don't miss them at all. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about the Dwarf yeah. Tomato Project because you were a co-founder, co-leader mm -hmm. of that, mm -hmm. and you are a tomato breeder. Like you have created yeah. tomato varieties. Walk us through what that means to, yeah. well, first of all, like you've shared a little bit about dwarf tomatoes. So yeah. you can share a little yeah. bit more about that and then tell us yeah. how do you create a new variety? Yeah. Of uh, so up until about the year, the mid 2000s, everybody knows about indeterminates. They grow tall. Everybody knows about determinants. They stay short. Indeterminants have the big, colorful, best flavors for the most part. Determinants, aroma, lots of productivity, not the best tomato you ever ate in your life. There was always lingering behind the scene a third type of tomato that very few people knew, knew about called dwarf tomatoes, and it's a separate genetic class. And seed catalogs mess this up all the time. They'll say, well, is your dwarf determinant or indeterminate? I'm like, it's dwarf. It behaves like an indeterminate and that it fruits until frost, the characteristic is it grows vertically at half of the rate. So if at the end of your season, you've got an eight foot Cherokee purple, your dwarf would be four feet tall because it just expands upward slower, but it doesn't need pruning. And in fact, if you prune a dwarf, you reduce the potential yield. You just let it all go. And what I love about them is the useless tomato cage is perfect for dwarfs. The four foot cone things that your indeterminates escape from within two weeks, your dwarf will stay nice and happily nestled into this thing throughout the growing season. So when we started the project, like I think I said earlier, a lot of my plant customers wanted to know what what they could grow that would taste great, be interesting, colorful, and yet it would it would stay short. And that's when I met this woman, Petrina, from Australia on the old Garden Web website. It was a discussion group from way back in the early 2000s. And it turns out she liked to create, she liked to cross varieties, take pollen from one parent, put them on the flowers of another parent. And I shared with her this idea of creating dwarf varieties. So we got our hands on the, the three or four known dwarfs at the time. There were very few. There was Dwarf Champion from the 1880s. There was Golden Dwarf Champion from the 1890s. Dwarf Stone from 1905. 
anybody who has grown the hybrid husky series knows what they're like. Those are actually dwarfs, but they never caught on. They were never promoted prop properly. They weren't very interesting to grow or very delicious. But So dwarfs have been am among us, but they're never really discussed as that. So we would take the great flavored heirlooms, the Cherokee purples, the green giants, the lily and yellows, the brandy wines, and take pollen from those and apply them to the flowers on these dwarfs. That would create a new hybrid. She would send me the seeds that she created. I would then grow it out, send seeds to her. We created a team. We'd bounce seeds all over the world and create this all-volunteer army of people just growing tomatoes to see what they got and then getting the results and sharing the results with me and the seeds. So what we ended up with is 157 is the latest total. So if you look into in the Victory Seed Catalog, they just released seven more this year. So you have 157 creations. Our very first were released in 2010. So it's taken 13 years to finalize they are stable. We've grown them out to the eighth generation or more, meaning if you get one of these dwarfs and grow them, you can save seeds from them, and they will be the exact same tomato year after year. What was fun about this project is learning about what happens when you take pollen from a green tomato and cross it with a red tomato or a purple tomato and cross them with a yellow tomato. Tomato genetics, we taught ourselves, and I'm going to be writing a book about this project. I've been saying this for years now. But Story wanted me to write it, my publisher, but they wanted too much creative control over it, and I didn't like what they wanted to call it, and they didn't want me to include a lot of the genetic details. So I said, okay, well, thank you for offering. I'm going to do it myself. So I'm going to write the book, self-publish it, and it's going to go into the detail of how we did all of our varieties, what they look like, what they taste like. And it's not like they're magic. They they're, they are very densely foliaged. So in very humid, warm areas, you have to really watch the foliage. And if you see the little early blight or septoria blemishes forming in the leaves, you have to get that off the plant. You have to give them adequate spacing so you have good air circulation, good sun exposure. I think the only other thing I'll say about him before you, you, I give you a chance to ask me anything I didn't talk about is we don't, I get a lot of, I live in Maine, I live in Canada, I live in Arizona. What dwarfs are going to do well for me? And the answer is we don't know yet because they're so new. We didn't breed them with disease resistance in mind. We, dread, we bred them with fun in mind, color, flavor, diversity. So in a way, anybody who grows these are participating in an experiment to see which ones will they love, which ones will they not love, which ones will thrive in Maine, which ones will die at the blink of a hat in Texas. So this that's what, you know, for me, the name of the book has to be crowd breeding because we have used a crowd of people all over the world to breed new tomatoes, but it's only step one. They're out there. The rest of the story gets written in the next 20, 30, 50 years when we see which ones become beloved, which ones get ignored, which ones need to be improved. And the project actually, I officially ended it in December in terms of aggressively pursuing new volunteers and new varieties. It, it, it felt time to say, you know, 157 are out there. We'll have another 10 coming next year. Pretty damn good. And so... I love to end things as much as I like to start things. And sometimes to start new things, you have to end something. But the story is only partially written. And I will certainly correspond with people, give them advice, keep an eye on what's doing well where, and just go along for the ride with them. So yeah, what it's it's been the most, I've, I've been working on it for 18 years, and it's probably been the most fun thing that I've done in the garden was to, you know, and, and how you do it actually is just a little vibrating pen you vibrate pollen off one tomato and go to a flower on the other tomato and pull off the little yellow parts and dip the tip into that pollen, do that three days in a row. And if a tomato forms, you have a new hybrid, that's your starting point to create new varieties. So I've taught myself a lot of tomato genetics doing this and it's been fun along the way. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that sounds like just such a great, <laughs> like crowdsourcing project yes. and yeah. 
you know, you, you talked about like, discovering what the beloved varieties are going to be over the years and just seeing like how different things do in different climates. And yeah, it's cool too, because there's such a community around that and you're really able to engage a wide, you know, audience of people who love tomatoes. And yeah, a term that I really like for this is citizen science because it's crowd breeding, Mm -hmm. but it's a form of citizen science because you're using amateurs volunteers nobody's getting paid for any of this they're doing it only for the love of it and when that happens you get their best because they're doing it for all the right reasons and yeah and the other thing is you and i both know we are garden gardeners are trying to hit a moving target so one of the reasons we never have it all sorted out is because each season is different and gardens trend in different directions in terms of temperature, in terms of rainfall, in terms of humidity, which brings in different diseases and different critters. So that's why I never call myself a gardening expert. We're, we're just constant learners. And by imparting what we learn, we hope to save some people the pain that we've experienced in the garden. But we also know human nature is to want to make the mistakes yourself, that sometimes that's the only way you can learn is is to make those mistakes. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> uh, so as a tomato breeder, I am sure you've gotten to name a lot of different mm. tomato varieties. You have also, which I think is, if I can say this on the podcast, probably one of the most like badass things that I <laughs> that I think you've done is name and popularize the Cherokee purple tomato. <laughs> oh my gosh. Speaking of a beloved tomato variety, this is a tomato that so many people love to grow and so many people look forward to. So can you please tell us that story? Yeah. Well, you know, if anything convinced me that I was meant to do this, it was that A man named John Green, who lived in Sevierville, Tennessee, he's since passed on, I was sad to learn, decided to to send to me seeds of an unnamed purple variety, as he called it in the letter, back in 1990. He knew through, you know, it's very quaint, the old gardening magazines back in the 80s and 90s that would have seed swaps in them. And so he saw my name in the back of Organic Gardening and National Gardening Association as someone who would participate in seed swaps. You know, I I amassed a big collection of heirlooms through the Seed Savers Exchange between 1986 and 1995. And so I just wanted to get these out there to people. And so he saw my name in one of those magazines and all of a sudden I get this letter. And I thought, you know, he said, here's a purple tomato. And he said, the, it, it, the Cherokee Indians passed it on and I received the seed. It's over 100 years old and it's purple. And I thought, well, it's probably going to be pink because from the old seed catalogs would call pink tomatoes like Brandywine purple back then. And I thought, it's probably nothing extraordinary, but I'm glad he sent it to me. But when I had it in my 1990 garden in Westchester, Pennsylvania, and I saw the color of it, that color had not really been seen before. So this really predates the the so-called black tomatoes, the black crims, the Cherokee chocolates, black prints, all those. And I, I said to Sue, man, I hope it tastes good because it certainly is something the likes of which you've never seen before. We took a taste. We're like, this is a damn good tomato. So yeah, it was a badass tomato. And so I thought, given the history, I have to name it. And one of the things I think that distinguishes gardeners from a lot of other pursuits is if we have something great, we can't wait to share it rather than I've got something great, you can't have it. We want everybody to have it. So I saved lots of seed, listed it in the Seed Saver Exchange, gave it the name Cherokee Purple, sent it to my friend Jeff McCormick, who ran Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, and he grew it. You know, he called me and he goes, this is 1992. Craig tasty tomato, interesting story, so ugly. No one is ever going to want to grow and eat that tomato. It's too much of a leap to eat a tomato that looks like a bruised leg. But I'll tell you what, I'm going to put it in my 1993 catalog with a caveat, only for the adventurous, new for 1993. And, you know, kind of the rest is history. A little bit more about the history, because I had gotten to talk to J.D., Mr. Green a few times over the years. And I 
When I was moving, I went through all of my information and I found a scrap of paper that I scribbled on while I was talking to him. And it turns out he received the tomato seeds from a woman named Jean Greenlee, who lived in Rutledge, Tennessee. Rutledge is quite close to Sevierville. It's, it's Cherokee Indian territory, the Cherokee Nation kind of in the North Carolina, Tennessee border. And so I think they must have met church event, a gardening event, but she she passed on seeds to JD. She got them from her grandfather in the 1800s, and he is the one that got the seeds from representatives of the Cherokee Nation. So that paints a little more of the picture. I am kicking myself because Miss, I believe Jean Greenlee is no longer with us either. So the road trip that I've yet to take is to head back to that area. Um, somebody once said, you need to contact Dolly Parton because that's her area, Pigeon Forge, Sevierville, um, Gatlinburg, and see if she knows any families who may have talked about you know, growing this distinctly colored tomato back then. Also to ask maybe way after the fact, permission and forgiveness to actually name a tomato that is that appear to be part of their nation. So I think our awareness in the last decade or two of becoming more aware of sensitivities, what we call things, what we name things, has made me really scrutinize the names of some of the things in my collection and wonder if any of them are hurtful or, you know, did we take advantage of, you know, the tomato Mexico midget is insanely popular. Is, is that an appropriate name for that tomato? Dwarf Tomato mm. Project. So so it's a, it's interesting that this old guy in the last five or 10 years has been forced to think a little bit about some of these culturally important things that maybe we never thought about. I mean, if you look at old seed catalogs, they're horrendous. The seed catalogs from the 1870s, 1880s, and 90s are, are horrendous, some of the things that are in there. Mm. So, so it added a different wrinkle to gardening in terms of consciousness and awareness of what we're growing and what we're calling things. Isn't that an interesting way to look at it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is. And it's, you know, it is, it's an interesting reflection. You know, you were talking about reflecting on, on seasons past and yeah, it's just, you know, it's a good reminder of mindfulness and all of yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it makes it that much more, it, it makes it that much more rich and diverse, but it also opens yourself yes. up sometimes into some personal challenges of, was I too mm. callous at this point in time? And do I need to think mm. a little bit more deeply? We actually did rename one of our dwarf tomatoes because of this. And so it, it, and there's been a lot of efforts, actually. Some of my friends have been involved in some variety renamings. You know, we've had different insects renamed we've had different birds renamed so it's it's an interesting time we're living in but you know it's it i think it's important to think about these things as we go along we you know i'm I'm sure not everybody agrees with this principle but i'm i want to be a good steward not only for the land but for the seeds that i have and make them a thing of joy for as many people as possible yes absolutely and you do it's such a joy (laughs) <laughs> to follow all the things that you share. Okay, so you live in Western North Carolina. I live mm. in the Piedmont of mm. North Carolina. The USDA just updated the hardiness mm. zone map at the end of last year. Yeah. And this podcast is very timely, going to be out in April. So tell me, when do you plant your tomatoes outside? Mm. And why do you choose that time? Absolutely. And, you know, the move to Andersonville was fascinating because in our 28 years of Raleigh, the year we moved in there, and I've gone back and looked at the weather data, 1992, we had three or four days at 90 or above. The year we moved out, 2019, we had 72 days of 90 or above. So for tomato growers, Days above 90 and humidity are extremely important things to keep in mind because they do impact plant health, uh, ability to fruit, ability to set fruit. Hendersonville is similar to Raleigh in some respects and very, very different. But my my general timings here, and this is where I I like to advise people, is think of your plant out date. 
and I work back two months and that's when I start my seed. So Hendersonville seems to be very happy with a May 1st plant out date. Sometimes you get surprised and you have to be creative with floating row cover or something like that because all of a sudden it's May 5th and you're going to get a possible frost that night. But I've never lost any plants planting them out at May 1st. And I find that a March 1st seed planting, that two months gets my plants to an, a very appropriate size for plant out. And I don't have a greenhouse. I, you know, if people can look at my website at the video section and I show how I start my seeds, how I transplant, and I just really use the weather. And on a sunny day, I'll get my seedlings out for a little while and I'll ease them in. You can fry your seedlings if you just say, oh, it's a sunny day. I'm just going to put them out there and forget about them. And you come back to three quarters of them are dead. Give them an hour, then give them two hours, then give them three hours. Within a week or two, they can live out there as long as you don't have frost. But what's really interesting about this is in Raleigh in my driveway, if my tomatoes came in in 75 to 80 days, here I'm in full sun, but we don't have the amount of heat. So those same varieties are coming in at 85 or 90 days in many cases. So just moving from one side of the state to the other practically has lengthened my tomato ripening time. Then we have different diseases that come in. So my harvest window is roughly July 15th to August 20th or 25th. Extremely heavy yield. And then boom, the plants are pretty much dead. I've had to learn the hard way about how I garden here. And succession garden sounds like it would be a nice thing to do. It's just we get a different set of diseases that start coming in in August and different sets of weather that makes succession planting very, very difficult because I've tried it a few times in late blight has has come in and wiped out those later planted plants. So I just go for that core of harvest. I can like a madman. We eat tomatoes like insane people. And then we say, okay, it's delicious. We're done. <laughs> and so we, we can 63 quarts and now we can make tomato bisque wow. all winter or, you know, things like that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. What, so what are, your, what are your, what are your dates like for a plant out date where you are out of curiosity? Yeah. Well, you know, of course, as there usually is, there's variance of opinion here. <laughs> you know, there, I have some clients that like to plant, you know, as soon as you have that nice warm day, yep. maybe in yep. early March. And that makes, you know, that gives me a little bit of anxiety. <laughs> Yes. But yeah, that, that's a little too soon. And historically, our frost date, our last average frost date has been like mid-April. Mm -hmm. But with this new USDA mm. hardiness zone map coming out, our frost date this year, you know, is the 5th of April. Yeah. So yeah. Good, bit, good bit earlier. I personally, <laughs> for, <laughs> for several reasons... <laughs> I usually plant my tomatoes, you know, the first two weeks of May. Yep. yep. Uh, so yeah, I'm right. I'm right there with you. You know, usually like before Mother's Day, mm. but sometimes it ends up being Mother's Day weekend. I think this year I've actually been noodling on planting earlier, but that's going to be a judgment call <laughs> once I can see the 10 day forecast. In yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the thing about tomatoes is like peppers and eggplant, they love their root zone being warm. So even if the weather isn't going to frost your plants, a tomato plant planted in cold soil is going to sit there, look at you, do nothing. And, and so you don't really save a lot on maturity dates and harvest by rushing the season. A lot of it's, it's actually better to let your soil warm, let your tomato plant get nice and healthy, get it in the ground and it catches up. So, you know, you can plant plants a month apart and within a month, they'll be the same height because, you know, but you can't discount people's wishes and desires. And, you know, I've never been a biggest tomato, earliest tomato. I've never been a contest gardener. I am a growing for Craig and Sue gardener for our own personal pleasure of growing what we love to eat and taking joy out of the different colors and flavors and stories. And so I'll have many emails. How do I grow the biggest tomato? Which is the biggest tomato? 
like I, I can tell you what the seed catalogs say, but I've, you know, I've never done that. I've never entered a contest for my plants. That's, I'm not a contest type of guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hear you. When I like, when I'm thinking about what I want to grow and spend the time to nurture and care for over the season, yeah. it's all of the things that I love eating and yes. that Marshall loves eating. And, yep. you know, that's just, that's what we grow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I have to ask this question. Sure. And it's about, you know, what your preference is on growing determinate versus indeterminate tomatoes. And I mean, I feel like I know the answer to this, but <laughs> what's your preference on those two? So between indeterminate, determinate, and dwarf, I grew very few determinants. I think determinants are great if you want to do mass canning. So taxi is a lovely little fairly early yellow tomato that will win no taste contest, but if you want to pick 20 pounds of tomatoes in a two-week period, it's great, and it stays in control. If you love Roma types because you like to roast and make sauce, you know, you, you pick 25 or 30 pounds of fruit all within a two-week period. But for me, the diversity of the colors and the flavors and the stories, it was almost, it, it would have been before the Dwarf Project indeterminate. Uh, but the dwarfs now have given me equivalence in a dwarf growth habit. So Dwarf Glorious Treat, which is an 8 to 12 ounce bicolored heart, is fully as delicious as any, nearly any indeterminate tomato I've ever had. Rosella Purple is a dead flavor giveaway for Cherokee Purple. That is an excellent question because at one point am I going to do a crossover and decide, well, instead of a set of indeterminate tomatoes this summer, I'm going to plant all dwarfs and trust that our project has delivered the goods and that I'm going to have an equivalent yield of equivalently excellent tomatoes. So this little interview we're having may make <laughs> me rethink what I want to plant. And should I replace, if I'm going to grow 12 tomatoes, should six of them be dwarfs so that I can then demonstrate to the world how much I trust what we've created? Ah, how Ooh. fun. You've planted yeah. a seed. You've planted a seed in my Oh, look brain. at that. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay, so we're we're getting ready to wrap up our conversation. And so soon, um, so soon. <laughs> I know. I Haven't know. we been talking just five minutes or so? Gardeners can talk forever. Haven't you found that? Oh, it's so true. It's so true. <laughs> and I have a feeling that that I might ask you to come back on this podcast at some point. Oh, well, you know, maybe we can work that out any, 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 any time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're the best. Okay. So I am going to be asking all of my podcast guests these two questions. So this first one, I also wonder if I can guess your answer. Craig, what is your favorite vegetable and why? You might have already answered this, but. You know, it it's it, my favorite vegetable is a tomato, but sure. we can't do without snap green beans. That is the vegetable that we love to eat the second most in a season. We, you know, we use beans as kind of an appetizer all through the summer. I'll, we'll just put freshly picked beans in boiling water and I set the timer for six or seven minutes. And then we just put butter, salt, pepper, and chives on them. And we put a big bowl between us. And then we just snack on them before dinner because they taste like sweet corn. They taste sweet and buttery and the texture is beautiful. So yeah, I would say I, I would number one tomatoes, but number one A would be uh, green beans for sure. Want? <laughs> yeah, green beans. Green beans and peas, like fresh snap peas oh. in the spring, those oh. rarely make it past like the edge of my raised beds because anytime yeah. I'm out there, I'm just like picking them and eating them. <laughs> well, to me, to me, the saddest gardening story is the incredible excellence of sugar snap peas compared with the relative difficulty in getting them in huge quantities. You know, you you could grow like a 50 foot row. And you'd still half of them wouldn't make it into the house, but they are a delicacy. We we think of sugar snap peas as a true delicacy. Yeah, they are delicious. Okay. And then the other question for all my podcast guests is what is the most important thing you've learned growing food? 
The most important thing about growing food is to live with your garden and understand it. So it's it it's not that you plant it and then take a week before you look at it again and you know you go to work and you're busy and you come home. The more time you spend with it, the more it will treat you well and the more you will learn from it so that you can then do even better with it the next year. And, you know, so you can have a plan, you and I plan, but with gardening, you can take your plan and and probably rip it up within the first two weeks because you, you kind of think, you know, what's going to happen. And then things come in that make it all different. You didn't have the time you thought the weather was a little bit different. You had a critter come through. So, you know, start with a great intent and start with a great plan, but then be flexible and be willing to roll with it and let your garden tell you what will make it happy. And then it will make you happy. Love that. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Craig, for your time today and just chatting about all things tomatoes. Can you tell us how people can follow what you're doing, be in the know about this book that you're writing about the dwarf tomatoes? And of course, I'll put all of this in the show notes as well. But just, yeah, let people know how to get in touch. Sure. Well, email me at nctomatoman at gmail.com. And I'm on email a lot. And I like to get back to people really, really quickly. And and I file everything in labeled folders. So I think I have every gardening email sent to me since 2010. So that way I have everybody's email in my inbox. So when it comes in again, I know who sent it to me. Instagram is my second favorite way of communicating. And probably by March, I will start up my Instagram lives again, where I sit in my backyard for 45 minutes, usually a Friday. Sometimes it changes a little bit. And I like to do show and tell. I show people what I'm growing but I leave lots of time for questions and I love to have guest people joining me. So definitely Erin is going to be sharing the screen with me and she can tell us all about what she's growing and take questions. And then the third thing is uh, my website, which is just craiglahulier.com where I'm a pretty active blogger. And right now it's not too far buried in my blog, but I did a series of garden updates where I described in detail everything I grew last year, all 180 tomatoes, for example. So a lot of people that requested seed from me went through those blogs, looked at what I thought about things, and many of the requests I got reflected those things I raved about. Silly me. (laughs) I got to be careful what I rave about in terms of my seed supply. So those are the three main things. The last thing I'll say is the tomato that was the best tomato in my garden the last two years is Captain Lucky. Captain Lucky. It is a tomato that was bred by someone who lived before he passed away only about five miles from my house named Millard Murdoch. And it is a color selection. The bees messed around with his lucky cross and he created Captain Lucky, and it's a potato leaf plant, and it's green and pinky purple on the outside, and it's mostly green in the inside with a little bit of pink. And it is, if any tomato is a 10 out of 10, it is Captain Lucky. So it's it's being sold by quite a few seed companies. You can Google it. I don't have any seed left to share, but it's out there. You can buy it. It is just a remarkable eating experience. So, you know, even after 40 years of gardening, you can still get your mind blown by a tomato you haven't grown before. And that was the one. Wow. Wow. That is high praise. (laughs) Well, thank you, Craig. This has been really wonderful. And yeah, cheers to tomato planting time. Let's have a great season this year. Everybody happy gardening. And, you know, any questions, I'm an email away. (laughs) Thanks so much, Craig. Thanks, Aaron. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Craig. Isn't he just a wealth of information? I told you. I know. He's pretty incredible. So if you want to learn more from Craig, be sure to check today's show notes for more information on how you can follow along. Craig does do pretty regular uh, Instagram lives uh, throughout the summer and will give you tours of his backyard, his different growing spaces, and walk you through the different things that he's learning from his tomatoes each year. 
One of the things that Craig and I really connect on and really bond on is the idea that as a food grower, especially a home food grower, there is a never ending supply of things to learn and practices to refine. And that's what keeps both me and Craig coming back year after year and season after season to grow food because you are never done learning when it comes to our plants. And that's really exciting and a great continuation for our food growing journeys. Now, if you are brand new to listening to this podcast, I want to just say hello and welcome. Thanks for tuning in. You may want to go back and give my first podcast episode a listen. And that is where I really introduce myself to you, my business, the patio farmer, and all the different things that I do to support others in their food growing journeys. Next week's episode, tune in, y'all. I am going to be sharing 10 tips for summer survival in pots. So we're going to focus mainly on container growing next week. And I'm going to share with you uh, some top tips, recommendations, things to keep in mind for preparing for the summer, the summer heat that lies ahead. So be sure to tune into next week's episode. And if you've listened to this podcast in the past, then you will know that at the end of every episode, I share a fun little fact that's usually not related to the rest of the episode at all. And if you have, if you're a repeat listener of the podcast, then you'll also know that around Christmas, or you'll also know that every Christmas, my partner buys me a new calendar for the year ahead. And last year's calendar, so for this year, for twenty for 2024, is all about pollinators. And so this month's pollinator is the only non-flying pollinator that exists out there in the world. It lives in Australia primarily, and it's the honey possum. The honey possum. You should definitely give it a little Google. It's a cute, tiny little marsupial. It lives on pollen and nectar alone. That's literally all this little, all this little critter eats. Um, And it's pretty cute. It's pretty cute. So I get to look at these lovely little illustrated depictions of the honey possum (laughs) on my calendar that sits in my office. So I thought I would just share that with you today. A fun little fact. Thanks for tuning in. And I really appreciate you being here. And I will see you back here next week for all things container growing. Thanks again for tuning into this week's episode of the Growing Space Podcast. I hope that you learned something new and that you were able to take this new information home with you and implement into your growing journey and into your growing space. As always, I am here to support you and your food growing journey. If you'd like to learn more about the different services and resources and membership programs that I run through The Patio Farmer, please check out my website, thepatiofarmer.com. You can also follow me on social media. I am on Facebook, Instagram, and oh my gosh, most recently, TikTok. Wow. I know. I know. Here I am. Patio Farmer is on TikTok. It's very exciting. If you enjoyed today's episode, please give it a like or a rating or a review if you want. Maybe share a little comment about your favorite part of the episode. Share it with a friend. The more interactions I get with my little podcast online, the more I'm able to help people just like you in their food growing journeys. As always, thanks for being here and I will see you again next week.